In the past several lectures, we've considered some of the non-canonical Gospels that were produced by early Christian writers. The Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the infancy Gospel of Thomas. We've seen that there are different kinds of apocryphal Gospels. Some of them are collections of Jesus' sayings. Others are accounts of his ministry and passion. Others are narratives of his birth and childhood. These apocryphal Gospels derive from a variety of groups of early Christians. Jewish Christian Ebionites, Gnostics, Proto-Orthodox Christians. But all of these non-canonical Gospels are relatively late, starting with the 2nd century. They date up actually through the 8th century. And all of them are highly legendary. All of them except perhaps the Gospel of Thomas, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. Most of these non-canonical Gospels are forged in the name of an apostolic authority. In this lecture, we'll move to a different genre of early Christian apocrypha, the apocryphal Acts of the Apostles. These two are late and legendary, but they are not forged. They're written about the apostles, not allegedly by them. Accounts of the lives of Jesus' apostles were common in early Christianity. The first account we have is actually in the New Testament itself the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles is an account of what happened to the followers of Jesus after his death and resurrection, as they spread the gospel of Jesus throughout the Roman world. The account begins with Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection and then ascending into heaven. Prior to his ascension, he has a brief discussion with them in which they want to know whether the kingdom of God is now to arrive on earth. Jesus tells them that it's not really up to them to know when the time of the end will come. Instead, they are to be his witnesses throughout the world. As he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in all of Judea and Samaria, and then unto the ends of the earth. The book of Acts, in fact, describes the spread of Jesus' gospel in Jerusalem, then into the areas of Judea and Samaria, and then finally throughout the Western Roman Empire up to the city of Rome with anticipation that in fact it will go even further to the West. The two main characters of the account in the book of Acts are Peter, the closest disciple of Jesus, who was the original head of the early church, and Paul, who became the greatest missionary of the church, who becomes the main figure for most of the book of Acts. Peter and Paul and the other apostles are empowered by God to spread the gospel to different parts of the Roman world, eventually to Rome itself. And they spread it among different kinds of people, first to Jews, then to Samaritans, then to Gentiles. The account of the book of Acts narrates numerous events that happened to the apostles Numerous miracles that they themselves performed as these apostles, like Jesus before them, could heal the sick, cast out demons, and even raise the dead. It describes numerous conversions to the faith. Early on, thousands of people convert to become followers of Jesus in Jerusalem at the preaching of the Apostle Peter. The biggest conversion of all is that of the Apostle Paul, narrated in Acts chapter 9. Paul, who becomes a follower of Christ after being a persecutor of Christ. And then once Paul converts, he becomes a great missionary. Much of the book of Acts narrates his own missionary journeys. It also details the internal conflicts that occur within Christianity, especially the conflict over whether Christians have to become Jewish, whether people who are non-Jewish need to become Jewish before they can convert to faith in Christ. Uh, this and all other issues are quite readily resolved as the Holy Spirit directs the Christian mission, according to this book. Persecutions come against this early church, but they too are readily overcome. The theme of the book of Acts is that the Christian mission, the spread of the gospel, comes from God as the apostles are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and nothing can stop this mission. 
This book of Acts does not provide a straight historical account of what transpired in the early days of Christianity. It obviously contains a theological understanding of the early Christian mission, written from a particular religious point of view of the author, the uh, same author who wrote the book, of, the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. This account, the book of Acts, was written sometime in the latter part of the first century, soon after Luke wrote his Gospel, possibly around the year 80 or 85 of, of the Common Era, 80 or 85 AD. In the second and third centuries, other accounts of the lives of the apostles were written by anonymous authors. Unlike the book of Acts in the New Testament, these other accounts focus on the lives and exploits of individual apostles. These are legendary, imaginative, and entertaining accounts of the wondrous activities of Jesus' closest followers. Among the apocryphal acts, we have a large number of fragmentary accounts, but five that are fairly complete books. The five are the Acts of John, Peter, Paul, Andrew, and Thomas. These are individual books on these five different apostles. Even many of these books are found in fragments, but uh, in most of these cases the fragments are extensive and can be put together into one long running narrative for these five apostles. We won't be able to examine all of these five accounts in this course, but we will be looking at three of the most interesting ones. Today we'll be looking at uh, the Acts of John. In the next lecture we'll be looking at the Acts of Thomas. And then finally we'll look at the Acts of Paul, especially the section of the Acts of Paul called the Acts of Paul and his female disciple, Thecla. In this lecture we deal with the Acts of John which concern the adventures, the missionary activities of John, the son of Zebedee. John, the son of Zebedee, was one of Jesus' closest disciples in the New Testament. In the New Testament Gospels, Jesus has an inner circle among the twelve. He has these twelve disciples, but there's an inner circle that's comprised of Peter, Simon Peter, James, and John. James and John are brothers who were fishermen before converting to follow Jesus sons of a man named Zebedee. Traditionally, John the son of Zebedee was thought to have been the beloved dis disciple who's described in the Gospel of John and who is thought traditionally to have been the author of the Gospel of John. He was quite an important figure in the history of the early church. According to the book of Acts, he was a prominent figure in the spread of Christianity in its early stages, but then he soon drops out of sight in that narrative. Our late second century Acts of John gives a fuller account of his activities. Unfortunately, this is one of the texts that has not survived completely intact, but in fragments. Scholars, though, have been able to piece together these fragments from various manuscripts to construct a running narrative. The narrative is very interesting. In it, we learn of many of John's exploits while engaged in his missionary activities in Asia Minor, uh, which is modern-day modern Turkey, especially in and around Ephesus, a major city of Asia Minor. During his missionary activities, John engages in a number of miraculous acts which help him spread the gospel of Christ, as narrated in a number of entertaining stories. Uh, in this lecture, I'll talk about some of these stories to show how John is being portrayed as a miraculous figure, and then hopefully through these stories we'll, we'll be able to see something of the overriding emphases of this particular apocryphal Acts, the Acts of John. John is portrayed in this, account, in this account as having a unique ability to raise the dead. One of the early accounts shows his miraculous powers. It's an interesting story involving uh, a man named Lycomedes and his beautiful wa young wife named Cleopatra. As it turns out, Cleopatra has died prematurely, but John is able to raise her from the dead to the joy and wonder of the entire city of Ephesus. I'll uh, summarize the story and uh, read you sections uh, of it so you get a sense for how this uh, apocryphal Acts actually works. 
We're told in the account that John had hastened to Ephesus, prompted by a vision. When he came near the city, Lycomedes, the commander-in-chief of the Ephesians, who was a wealthy man, met us, we're told. So this is being written in the first person by somebody other than John. We're not told who the author uh, actually is. As it turns out, this uh, leader of the Ephesians, Lycomedes, has found out from a vision that John was coming to visit the Ephesians, and he uh, asks John to come and help him because his wife has, uh, has been paralyzed for seven days, and he asks John to show compassion on her by raising her up. When Lycomedes and John came to the house in which the woman was lying, we're told, he grasped, he grasped his feet again, Lycomedes grasped John's feet, and said, See, Lord, the lost beauty, see the youth, see the much-talked-of bloom of my unhappy wife, the admiration of all Ephesus. Woe to me, unhappy man! I was envied, humbled, and the enemy's eyes was fixed, uh, eye was fixed on me. And he goes on to, to uh, bemoan his fate because now, it, as it turns out, uh, Cleopatra is not just paralyzed, Cleopatra has died. Lycomedes spoke to Cleopatra, went up to her couch, she's lying there dead on her couch, and he cries bitterly. But John drew him away and said, Abandon these tears and unbecoming words. But Lycomedes fell to the ground and wept dejectedly. And it turns out that Lycomedes, out of uh, grief for his fallen wife, now himself has, has died. The man lies here lifeless, we're told. And I know that I shall not leave this house alive, says John. Uh, John is afraid that since Lycomedes has died while he's there, that the Ephesians are going to rise up and kill him. John cries out, Why do you delay, O Lord, from raising her from the dead? While John was crying, the entire city of Ephesus ran to the house of Lycomedes. You can get a sense of uh, some of the hyperbole uh, with the entire population, the many thousands of people living in Ephesus running to Lycomedes' house. Uh, the entire city of Ephesus runs to the house of Lycomedes, supposing him to be dead. When John saw the multitude, he prayed to the Lord, Now is the time of refreshing and confidence has come with you, O Christ. And he went over to Cleopatra, he touches her face and he says to her, Cleopatra, he whom every ruler fears and every creature, power, abyss and darkness and unsmiling death and the heights of heaven and caverns of the lower world and the resurrection of the dead and the sight of the blind, etc., etc. He's talking about God who is all-powerful. He says, in his name rise and become not a pretext for many who will not believe and an affliction for souls of hope and could be saved. And Cleopatra immediately rises up and says, I will rise, Master, save your handmaiden. When she had risen after the seven days, the whole city of Ephesus was stirred by the miraculous sight. But then there's still a problem, because now Lycomedes uh, is dead, uh, and Cleopatra then follows John into the room and sees her, sees her husband dead in front of her. And then John gives her the power, Cleopatra, to raise her husband from the dead, she went and spoke to her husband as she was told, and immediately she raised him. Having risen, he fell down and kissed the feet of John. He lifted him up and said, Man, kiss not my feet, but God's, by whose power both of you have risen. Here's an account, then, of the power of the apostle, who is able to raise people from the dead through the power of Christ. This is typical of the Acts of the Apostles, showing that these apostles were not mere mortals, they were men who were inspired by the power of God, who were able then even to raise the dead. There's another account of John raising the dead in the Acts of John. It's an account that's somewhat more bizarre than the one we've just examined. This bizarre account is actually quite famous and made quite an impact on Christian imagination through the Middle Ages. It's the story of the raising of Drusiana, the chaste and beautiful wife of a man named Andronicus. This is an account that involves almost unheard of chastity and crass immorality, a tale of attempted necrophilia, supernatural intervention, miraculous resurrection, and conversion to the life of purity. It's a long and somewhat involved story. Rather than read it, I'll summarize the main parts of the narrative just to give you a sense of how entertaining some of these early Christian fictions can be. 
According to this account, Drusiana is the beautiful wife of a man named Andronicus. They, too, live in the city of Ephesus. According to the account, both of them have converted to Christianity through the missionary preaching of the Apostle John. And as part of their commitment to Christ, they decide to remain celibate, even with one another. But there's another man who's a prominent citizen of Ephesus named Callimachus, who enters into the picture, who falls in love with Drusiana, even though she's married and committed to chastity, and he, Callimachus, wants to commit adultery with her. She feels incredible guilt in stirring up such a wicked desire in Callimachus, and as a result of her feeling so guilty, she becomes ill and she dies. They bury Drusiana in her family tomb. Callimachus, though, continues to feel passion for her, so much so that he bribes the family steward to let him into the crypt so that he can have sex with her even though she's dead. Uh, and so he bribes the steward and he's let into the, into the crypt. But before he can perform the wicked deed, a serpent appears that bites the steward that had let him in, killing him. And then the serpent entwines itself around Callimachus. As it turns out, the Apostle John and Andronicus come to the crypt. They find the doors open. Entering in, they find an angel who informs them of what has happened. They then see the dead steward, and they see Callimachus lying underneath the serpent. And, of course, they see the dead Drusiana. After that, there is a scene of repeated resuscitation. First, John raises Callimachus, who had been planning this act of necrophilia. He raises him up from the dead. Callimachus confesses to everything that he had done and everything that he had wanted to do. Then John raises Drusiana from the dead. Drusiana wants the steward to be raised from the dead, and she does so herself. Callimachus, after rising from the dead, converts to faith in Christ and becomes a pure and chaste Christian. The steward who is raised from the dead, though, does not convert to Christ as a result of his resurrection. Instead, he curses them all, wishes himself still to be dead, and runs from the tomb. As it turns out, they find him later, dead, felled by a poisonous serpent bite. And so the story ends. This, then, is the kind of entertaining romance one can find in the apocryphal acts of the apostles. These stories often involve sex and love and adventure and death and miracles. But in particular, they involve commitment to Christ as being more important than either love or sex. Sex, in fact, according to these accounts, as we'll see more extensively in, uh, in ones that we read subsequently, sex in these accounts is to be spurned for the sake of one's commitment to God through Christ. This account shows, then, John's ability to raise people from the dead. It shows his supernatural powers in other ways as well. John, in these accounts, is shown to be a superman whose powers can dispel and overthrow all pagan forms of worship. We need to remember that these apocryphal acts, written in the second century, the third century, are being produced in a time when the world was principally and uh, almost exclusively pagan. It's hard to know the demographics of the ancient world. In the Roman Empire, it's usually thought that the population at this time, second and third century, was around 60 million people. Moreover, it's normally thought that among the 60 million people, something like 7% of the population was probably Jewish, so maybe 4 million Jews in the world at the time. But Christianity in the second and third centuries is a very small minority. Starting at the beginning of, this, of the uh, second century, 
we're talking maybe hundreds of thousands of Christians, not millions yet. Second and third centuries, the numbers start increasing. It's not until the beginning of the fourth century that Christianity can claim anything like 5% of the population. And so in the second and third century, we're talking about maybe 2%, 3%. Christians, as we've seen already to some extent, and as we'll see even um, more extensively later, were a persecuted minority within the Roman Empire, in part because they refused to worship the state gods. They, review, they refused to participate in state religion. The Jews did as well, but they had ancient traditions that they could fall back upon. The Christians did not. The Christians saw themselves as a beleaguered minority. And so it's no surprise that these Christians tell stories of the superiority of their faith to everything that the pagans can offer. This can be seen in the interesting story in the Acts of John of John's overcoming of the goddess Artemis, who was the city goddess of Ephesus. Artemis has a huge temple in Ephesus. During the birthday of this temple, they have a huge celebration, we're told. Everybody from the city comes to the temple to worship Artemis in her home there where her idols are kept. John himself goes to this temple, though not to worship Artemis, but in order to show the superiority of his god to the gods of the pagans. Everybody appears in this temple dressed in white, but we're told that John appears dressed in black. People are afraid when they see John uh, present among them because they know his supernatural powers. They know the tales of him raising people from the dead. They know that, in fact, his god is more powerful than the gods of the city, especially than Artemis. They ask, they ask John not to harm them, but John utters a prayer to the one true God, and as a result of his prayer, the foundations of the temple begin to quake. An earthquake happens. The altar is split in half, and many of the idols of Artemis are shattered simply on the basis of John's prayer. This is a story that's attempting to show that the God of John, who's the God of Jesus, is superior to anything else one can find in the world. These Christians are telling stories like this in order to justify their own faith and in order to show that other people need, need to convert to faith in this God because this God is more powerful than any other. In the ancient world, people worshipped the gods principally because the gods were thought to be able to provide them with the things that were necessary for life. Pagan religions were centered around the present life, what one can acquire from the gods now in a world that is very, uh, that's dangerous, when people are living near the edge, when people don't have enough to eat, when people are worried about the crops, people worried about the health, the God, their health, gods can provide the things that they need. If the God of Jesus can be shown to be more powerful than the other gods, then surely people will convert to faith in the God of Jesus. In this account, when John destroys the temple of Artemis, in fact, everybody converts and says that the God of John is all-powerful. And so it includes a kind of a conversion story to faith in this God. John is shown to be powerful in a number of other stories as well, some of them rather amusing. Probably the best known anecdote from this apocryphal Acts of John involves John's power over the forces of nature in the, uh, in the presence of bedbugs in an inn in which he is staying. Uh, John is staying in an inn during his uh, endeavors. He's got a group of people who are following along with him, other Christians engaged also in his missionary activities. He decides to spend the night in an inn. He crawls into the bed that's available, but it's filled with bed bugs. He's irritated because it's been a long day and he wants to sleep. He, uh, he commands the bed bugs to leave the bed so that he can rest in peace. His fellows laugh at him for doing this, but then in the next morning they wake up and they see that, in fact, uh, hundreds of bugs are gathered underneath the door. John then wakes up refreshed from an evening's sleep, and he tells the bed bugs they can now return to their home. He gets up, they return to the bed, and he goes on his missionary endeavors. This portrayal of John as superhuman, who has power over death, power of the gods, and power over the bed bugs, this portrayal of John as superhuman is designed, of course, to show the superiority of his own gospel proclamation. One of the most interesting features of the apocryphal Acts of John, however, 
is that the description of Christ in this gospel proclamation appears somewhat suspect in terms of its orthodoxy. The portrayal of Christ is suspected as being somewhat unorthodox in this account. In one of the most intriguing passages of the book, John describes Christ as one who did not have a real flesh and blood body, who could change his appearances at will, and who was not actually present physically at the cross during the crucifixion. The account otherwise sounds completely proto-orthodox, but is it in fact influenced by Gnostic or Docetic understandings of Christ? Let me read for you some of the, uh, some of the passages involved. This is from one of the fragments uh, of, of the account of John's activities. John says that uh, when he had chosen Peter and when Jesus had chosen Peter and Andrew, who were brothers, he came also to me and to my brother James, saying, I have need, to, need of you, come to me. My brother said, John, this child on the shore who called us, what does he want? And I said, what child? He replied, the one that's beckoning to us. And I answered, because of our long watch that we kept at sea, you're not seeing straight, brother James. Don't you see the man who stands there, fair and comely and of a cheerful countenance? But he said to me, him I don't see, brother. But let's go and we shall see what this means. So James sees a uh, young child on the shore, but John sees a grown man. Well, as it turns out, Jesus changes appearances and he appears to different people in different guises at the same time. He goes on to say, Yet to me there appeared a still more wonderful sight, for I tried to see Jesus as he was, and I never at any time saw his eyes closing, but only open. So Jesus doesn't blink. And sometimes he appeared to me as a small man and unattractive, and then again as one reaching up to heaven. Sometimes his breast felt to me smooth and tender, and sometimes hard like a stone so that I was perplexed in myself and said, what does this mean? He goes on to say, another glory I'll tell you, brethren. Sometimes when I meant to touch him, I meant a material and solid body, and at other times when I felt him, the substance was immaterial and bodiless as if it were not existing at all. And often, when I was walking with him, I wished to see whether the print of his foot appeared upon the earth, for I saw himself raising himself from the earth, but I never saw the footprint. So Jesus doesn't blink. His body sometimes is immaterial. He doesn't leave footprints. What kind of understanding of Jesus is this? Well, it sounds very much like an understanding that we've seen in uh, non-Orthodox circles, in Gnostic and Docetic understandings of Jesus, where he doesn't have a real body. This becomes particularly clear when John is describing what happens at the crucifixion, where, in fact, Jesus is talking to, uh, to John, and he says, As for seeing me as I am in reality, I've told you this is impossible unless you are able to see me as my, kin see me as my kinsman. You hear that I suffered, yet I suffered not. That I suffered not, yet I did suffer. You heard that I was pierced, Yet was I not wounded, hanged, and was I not hanged? In other words, I was uh, you saw me hanged, but yet I wasn't hanged. The blood flowed from me, yet it did not flow. And in a word, those things that you say of me I did not endure, and the things that, though, that do not, uh, they do not say, those I suffered. This is one of these complete paradoxes, that Jesus suffers, yet he doesn't really suffer. He feels pain, but he doesn't really feel pain. He looks to be mortal, he looks to be human, but in fact he's not really human. It's difficult to know whether this lengthy passage describing Christ was originally part of the book or if it was instead taken from a different writing, but it's quite clear that these passages at least look more Gnostic than proto-Orthodox, whereas the rest of the book, entertaining as it is, appears entirely Orthodox. As I've indicated, most scholars date the Acts of John sometime in the second century. This would make sense of its overarching themes. Let me summarize them for you now in conclusion. 
Christianity is portrayed here as superior to all opposition, both pagan and Jewish. The apostles are thought of as superhumans, whose miracles seem even greater than those of Jesus himself, as recounted in the New Testament. There's a strong stress on the need for purity, especially sexual chastity. This is an ascetic view that will become increasingly popular in the second century. And overall, there's a stress on otherworldliness, on rejecting the lure of material things of this world in exchange for the treasures of heaven. These, then, are the themes that we will see as well in the other apocryphal acts in the two lectures to come.